but we're in five about memory systems. And this slide is a good one that I'd like to call our attention back to. Um, uh, we were summarizing cache hits and cache misses and talking about cache design. And there's three main categories of cache miss. And of course, our goal, as you know, is to have the hit rate high so that the memory system in the hierarchy performs like the speed of the small, highest level memory, even though we didn't buy very much. Most of our money is invested in the low speed, cheap stuff, but we've got enough of the high speed, uh, high price stuff, that if we get a good hit rate, the whole hierarchy will give us performance like the small amount. Nobody wants to buy, you know, 260 gigabytes of main memory. That would be too expensive. Two or four or one or whatever you have is about all that you can afford. But if you can get the performance of uh, uh, main memory and yet the size of a hard drive uh, for the cheap price of a little bit of main memory and a lot of hard drive, why not? That's the, art. That's the principle of memory hierarchy. Anyway, uh, the sources of our misses are listed on this slide. And we did this last Tuesday a week ago, but I'd like to just review. Um, compulsory misses are the ones that you can't avoid. They happen in the beginning. It's the first reference to um, a memory block or a, a cache block. And it's just a cold fact of life that you're going to miss the first time because it's no way it can be in the cache. You can make the block size bigger so that when you miss on one member of the cache, you fetch a large block and now you're likely to hit hit on the other members of the block, that's using spatial locality. But of course, doing that makes the miss penalty bigger, because if you miss now, going and getting a block of four or a block of eight is four or eight times longer than getting a block of one. Um, the second kind of miss is capacity miss. Uh, the cache is full of all good things, all recently accessed, likely to be called upon data, but it's not big enough and there's more that doesn't fit in the cache. The cache is too small for the set of active data or code that you're accessing, so you're going to therefore have misses. And the only solution to that is make the cache size bigger. But when you make cache bigger, the hit time gets bigger also because bigger memories are slower than smaller memories. So let's make a bigger cache. You automatically said, let's slow down our cache. Now, don't forget the hit rate is the thing that happens you know, most of the time, 90% of the time. So the hit time, if you slow it down, you slow down the performance of the whole system because you're hoping 90% of the time to hit in 10. If you make it bigger, now you're going to be hitting in 11 or 12 or 13, right? So the time for a hit gets worse as the cache gets bigger. That's, every one of these has one of these kind of Tavi's things. Fixing this causes a different problem, okay? The third category is conflict misses, and that comes from mapping n to 1. If the location that uh, this memory block is stored in in cache conflicts with the location that this memory block is stored in in cache, they cannot both be in cache at the same time, and we will have what are called conflict misses if we're accessing both of them because they'll be missing in cache. And so one solution is to increase the cache size and decrease the n. So we get a smaller mapping of n to 1. Therefore, bigger cache would mean less likelihood of conflict. Another possibility is to increase what's called the associativity. See the second bullet point over there? Associativity is something I haven't taught you about yet, but it's the, uh, the association factor between memory and cache locations. Right now, we just map to one. If I could associate a memory location with more than one possible block in the cache, or index in the cache, then it has choices. I'll go here, oh, unless something else is there, then I'll go here. I could be put in two places, or four places, or eight places. Then we would reduce the conflict misses. So those are, that's kind of a summary of what we've talked about so far with uh, cache memory. Remember we talked about how to handle cache misses when it's a read miss and a write miss, um, and we came to this right here. So um, what about when you have multi-block uh, cache entries? Okay, does that change anything? And the answer is yes. This simple analysis is for single word blocks. If we increase the size of the blocks, <coughs> then when we read and try to read and miss, um, we are going to be processing it the same way as if it was a single word block. When you read and miss, you're going to go get it, bring it in, and now you'll have it from that point on. So a miss returns the entire block from memory, and of course that means the miss penalty grows as the block size grows. So misses cost more in terms of the miss penalty. Now you could work on that. There's a couple suggestions in red to try to uh, reduce that. One is early restart. So if you miss and you're bringing in a block, as soon as the requested word is in, 
you restart even though the rest of the block is still coming in. Let's say I have a block size of 8 and I ask for one and it's not there so I bring in a block size of 8. And Let's say the one I wanted is the third one in. Then as soon as the first one's in I can't restart. As soon as the second one's in I can't restart. As soon as the third one's in I can do early restart and continue on with whatever the processor was doing while number 4 and 5 and 6 and 7 and 8 are coming in. Got it? So I don't wait till the whole block's in. I do early restart as soon as the one I wanted is in. Another possibility is requested word first. So you missed on a block of eight, and so here it comes. Make sure that the one you wanted comes first, and go with that one, and then the rest of them can come in later. So that's even better than early restart. You uh, immediately start the process. You go straight to the processor and the cache, the one you asked for. Now, one other possibility is non-blocking cache. Non-blocking cache says uh, uh, even while the cache is processing, processing a miss, the processor is allowed to go on, and so to continue accessing the cache while it's handling an earlier miss. So one cache miss doesn't slow up the cache for the next access. You're still fix fixing the last miss, bringing in this big block, but you allow the cache to be accessed by the processor anyway. Those are for read misses. Now for write misses, if you remember, <coughs> we had some interesting solutions on write. We had uh, stall a pipeline. We had write allocate and we had don't write allocate. No write allocate says skip writing it into the cache. But on write allocate, we're going to write the word into the cache. Um, so therefore, um, if we're using write allocate and it's a multi-block one, now we have a problem. Hmm. The block that's there isn't the one I want. And I want to write something new. But it's multi-block. So that means if I write one new thing, the one I know, there'll be one new and three old or one new and seven old. I'll have a partly old, partly new block from two different possible places even in uh, memory. That's risky business and we don't want to go there. We do not want to allow that. So if you're using write allocate, you first have to fetch and bring in the block that the new word belongs to and then do the write. Ooh, very painful. First bring in the full block, then do the write on top of that. Right allocate sounds like it's going to cost us a lot of time, and it is. But if you don't do that, you'll end up with, as you see there, a garbled block with a mix of new and old things which are not even related to each other. So that won't be good at all. Okay, so different right, as you see here, therefore, different right policies on right miss uh, have their effect n not just on single word blocks, but a special extra effect on multi word blocks. So multi word blocks makes things even more interesting for write misses and read misses. That's the point of these two slides. All right, that brings us to a whole new topic. So it's always good to stop and summarize and ask if there's questions about the whole business of reading and writing, missing on cache, multi-word blocks, the whole thing that we've shown so far with a direct mapped cache. We haven't shown associativity yet. We've only shown n to 1, right? Remember that kind of cache. That's what we've worked on. But we've shown how you could have multiple word blocks and that would help with some things but hurt with some other things. Getting the idea that this is interesting and complicated and memory system design, even cache system design requires some serious level of engineering wisdom and expertise and it's kind of art and science together. Yes, there's hard numbers. Yes, there's studies. Yes, there's work associated with this. But there's also some design freedom in doing this. Not all cache systems are the same. There's not one right answer that fits all processors or fits all computing systems. So it's an interesting area uh, and I'm just touching on the surface of it here for you. I hope I've made you not confused but interested in realizing the water's gotten deeper here. I hope you're a good swimmer because this is not shallow water where you just wade out. We're getting into deeper water here, but this is good stuff. This is the real engineering stuff happens when you start getting into this kind of thing. Until now, we've been just kind of teaching basic principles, but this gets into some definitely more complicated issues. All right. If you're okay with this and don't have any particular questions right now, then I'd like to move on because we're two hours short from last Friday's by Ram, so we've got work to do. Okay, now the next issue that we're going to look at is how to move data from memory into um, the processor. You can see here we've got CPU, which has got its own bus to cache, and then we've got cache, which has its own bus to main memory. And as you know, our goals are to move the things that we need here into here so that we'll have high hit rates, and when we ask, we'll find most of them here. But when there's misses, life has to, uh, things have to travel across here. So it's this bus that we're particularly interested in. You'll notice that we've written there some basic assumptions. Let's say that our data is 32-bit, our instructions are 32 bits, and that we're allowed to give a 32-bit address 
per cycle. That's talking about bus cycles, I'm not talking about CPU cycles, but buses have their own, as you know, cycle times and bus, uh, bus rates, etc. Okay, the off-chip interconnect and memory architecture can affect the overall system performance. What am I talking about? This is called on-chip. This pro Processors and their high-level caches are usually on a single chip. So when we talk about off-chip, we're talking about a system bus. That means it's on the motherboard or on the card. It's not inside the chip. This is a bus too, but this is an off-chip bus. We all know, don't we, from CS223 that anything on-chip is going to be smaller, therefore faster. Anything off-chip is going to be bigger, therefore slower. So this bus will not be able to move data at the same rate as this bus, clearly. Clearly. All right. That's the first thing. So this is an off-chip bus on the card. Of course, its speed is affected by the length of it, the electromagnetic issues related to interference and signal clarity, etc. There's quite a lot of electrical engineering to design a good bus. And you've seen motherboards. They cost $100 or more to buy a good card. There's good cards and bad cards. When you go to the shop and talk about it, they talk about quality levels. Yeah, there's a lot to designing a motherboard because the buses and the organization of it needs to be as dense as possible, and yet the signal quality as clean as possible. Quite a challenge just there on the electromagnetics. All right, anyway, let's, let's say that, and what the claim is that we're going to see in the next few slides, that this interconnect and this architecture can affect system performance in a dramatic way. Does it affect it a little? The answer is no, it affects it a lot. Oh, well, then if it's not a little 2% factor, I better pay attention. If it's 20 or 50%, I better wake up and pay attention. This is going to affect the whole system performance. Or another way to say it is, you can have the world's hottest chip, the world's best cache system, the world's fastest processor with multi-pipelines and blah, 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 and you could still have a terrible system performance. Why? Because you killed it from here down. You killed it from here down. You spent all this money, four or $500 on this hot chip, great multi-core you know, processor, and then you wasted it all away with a poor system design, memory, and bus. That's the other way to say this, is it dramatically affects it both this way and this way. So that's something that should concern us all as engineers, is to get the performance out of the system that we invested in our processor chip. You're in the business right now of designing a processor, and you know that its performance is very important, but now we're showing that the line from here to here matters and from here to here matters. So yes, we want high hit rates so that our memory behaves like this and not like this, that's true. You know, this is part of the hierarchy. But we also want to make sure that when we have to move things like this, we don't slow the thing down even more. That's, that's the background behind this slide. OK, so we're going to make some assumptions. And then in the next slides, we're going to do some calculations. We're going to assume that it takes one memory bus cycle to send the address. That's kind of what it says here. You can send one address per memory bus cycle. It takes 15 memory bus cycles to get the first word in block from DRAM. Why does it take 15 cycles to get the first word out from DRAM? Why does it take 15 memory bus cycles? That means the memory bus drinks tea for 15 cycles and finally, hey, Kardash, where have you been? Here comes the first data out of DRAM. Why? Why don't we just say, I want it, and bingo, it pops out of DRAM. Why so slow? Well, do you remember we studied DRAM in CS223? We looked at the architecture of it, and what do you know about it? Finding the correct cell or group of cells for the bits takes a long time. When, some, when an action takes a long time, we say it has high latency. All right, so getting the first bits out takes a long time because they're related to this two-way decode, latching in the row address, latching in the column address. It's an enormous matrix. I think all of us know we're up to almost a billion you know, storage cells per thing and all organized square with big, big multiplexers, two-way, cache gate, we could have three-way. Remember all that architectural stuff? DRAMs are really slow to access. Or another way to put it is, if you have 40 nanosecond DRAM access, then that means your bus cycles are more on the order of two or two and a half nanosecond, but there's no DRAM in the world that can give you a response in two and a half nanoseconds. No DRAM in the world can give you a response in two and a half nanoseconds. Actually, bus cycles are more like 800 megahertz these days, 667 and 800 megahertz, so we're getting down closer to one nanosecond bus cycles for memory access, but there's no DRAM in the world that can do it in one or two or even five. SRAM? Aha! Uh -huh. DRAM, no way, Jose. DRAMs are slow. We remember that, don't we? DRAMs are really slow compared to static RAMs. 
So the latency is high. You just have to drink some tea. And the cash says, hey, I need it, Big Abby. Better have a big pot of tea. You're going to be drinking a lot of tea until the first one comes out of the DRAM. Now the good news is, DRAMs are organized so that after that long tea drinking break, then they start sending data pretty fast. So if you get a big amount of data, you wait along for the first one, and then they start popping out every bus cycle. You can start to really pipeline it and get it out. But the latency is low, even if the bandwidth is high. Once it starts to come, you can pump a lot of data, especially if you make this wide and get a lot at once. But you can't speed up this wait time in the beginning. It just takes time to access dynamic RAM. Well, then how about if we don't use dynamic RAM? How about if we use static RAM? Great. Burn a lot of power, burn a lot of money, see how big you can get. Maybe you can get a few hundred megabytes. I don't think you're going to get in the gigabyte range with static RAM. It's just going to be too, too, too doggone expensive and too, too, too doggone hot and too, too, too doggone big. So, too bad. Memory hierarchy says down low, it's cheap and little, but slow. That's life. That's life. What are you going to do? Yeah, oh, my dad's really rich. I'm going to get four gigabytes of static RAM. Okay, better get some fans and liquid cooling too because it pumps a lot of heat out. All right, it's much less dense and much burns much more power. Okay, so you can see what happens here. Uh, five memory bus clock cycles for the second, third, fourth words, etc. So we can, after a long wait, then we can get them a lot faster. Okay, and then one memory bus cycle to return a word of data. Okay, so that's, those are our kind of assumptions. One to send an address. 15 to get the first data word out, uh, five after that for each successive data word, one to return a word of data. Now, that's uh, one set of assumptions. The second thing is memory bus to cache bandwidth, that's this bandwidth here, is the number of bytes accessed, and this is latency, now we're talking bandwidth, it's the number of uh, bytes accessed from memory and transferred to the chip per memory bus clock cycle. Yeah. So if you just look at that, you'd say it's one word in 16, right? But if you start to do a lot, and if we increase the width of this and do some tricks, you're going to see it's going to get better and better. Let's start with our quick review of uh, SD RAM, okay? Synchronous dynamic RAM, not static dynamic. That's zit. That's like black, white, girl, boy. You know, it's not static dynamic RAM. It's synchronous dynamic RAM. What does that mean? that even though fundamentally DRAM is an asynchronous device, we're going to put a clock on it and time it. We're going to actually make it obey clock pulse signals. We talked a little bit about this, SDRAM, which also goes by the name DDR, double data rate, and then there's other versions of it. But basically, after a row is read into the SRAM register, um, then we input a CAS signal to start the burst, we transfer a burst of data. Ideally, it's the size of a cache block from a series of sequential addresses. See, once we access a row, then we want to get a whole lot of data off of that row because it's too long to warm up to get the row. But once you've got the row, you can get it out pretty fast. And then memory bus clock controls the transfer of successive words in the burst. So let's have a look here. Send the row address and send the column address. And you can get the first embed access, and then the second embed access, third embed, fourth. Got it? So the cycle time, once you've accessed a row to get and a column to get out, is very quick. This can be a rather low cycle time for uh, the bus. And you can see that all we're doing is just incrementing the column address. So we're taking, once we have a row, column, 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 and getting data, 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 because the column access time is fast compared to the row access time. And you can overlap it as well. All right, so given that that's the architecture of um, DDR RAMs or SD RAMs, if the block size is one word, then for a memory access due to a cache miss, you're going to go get a one word block. The pipeline is going to have to stall for some number of cycles in order to do the following things. One cycle for memory bus uh, to send the address, um, 15 uh, to actually get the data um, from the DRAM into the cache and one to read it. So the grand total is 17 cycles to get one word. Um, oh, I'm sorry, it's kind of whacked up here, but you can see that a word is four bytes, so we're going to get four bytes in 17 cycles or 0.235 bytes per memory bus cycle. The number of bytes transferred per clock cycle for a single miss is, and it's off the bottom here, yeah, I guess it's four. Number of bytes, because you're getting one word, so we're going to get it in four bytes. 
Now, what if the block size is four words instead of one word? So now it's 16 bytes. Um, oh, man, the slide came out really bad. I'm awfully sorry. Um, OK, so we're going to now spend um, one cycle to send the first address. Uh, each one of these reads, remember, takes 15. And we're looking at four different addresses. So we're going to have 4 times 15, 60 cycles to read it, and one more to finish it up, grand total 62. You notice there can be some overlap here. These 15 cycles to do that read can be immediately followed by those, so that the blue and the uh, green are actually overlapped. I'm getting a little bit better performance. Instead of 4 times 17, which is, what is that, 34, 68, I do it in 62. Right, so I got a little bit of gain here, a little bit better performance to get 16 bytes in 62 clock cycles. But that's not the real thing. I, I think you can see that to really get good performance, I'm going to have to overlap uh, the, uh, the reads. Okay, now, what if the block size is four words and all the words are from the same DRAM row? Okay, well, in this case, the first one takes 15, but because the others are successive addresses, or at least in the same row, if I make my block be having spatial locality and I map that spatial locality into the DRAM, then it's 15 plus 5 plus 5 plus 5, right? These become shorter because they're not just random values in the same block, they're related address locations in the same block, okay? But that means I have to map logical locations into those physical locations and keep that mapping uh, one to one. Anyway, I can do it now in 32. So now I've got 16 bytes of data. Four here, then four here, four here, four here, coming in 32. So obviously I cut it almost in half. So I increase the data transfer rate, the bandwidth. But notice, I still don't get anything until 1 plus 15. The 16th clock cycle is when I finally get my first bit of data. Everybody see that? 16th clock cycle. N none of this speeded that up. I might have overlapped all this, but to get my first data, I still have to wait 1 plus 15 more. After that, things start getting faster. Now what about this? Whoa, get the whole thing done in 20. Look what we've done here. We've got a single cycle to send the address. I've got a kind of memory that allows me to do four parallel reads at the same time. And then I have these four cycles to return the last data word, which are staggered. So the grand total is 20 clock cycles to get out 16 bytes of data. Now I've almost got it down to a byte per clock cycle. So I started at 0.2, and now I'm almost up to, to 1.0. Now, what's been done here is a trick called interleaved memory. Okay? What I'm going to do is I allow my DRAM to be in banks. You might say it's multi-ported. I've got a read port and a read port and a read port and a read port, so it's four-ported. And if I spread my uh, related uh, data blocks out nicely, then one address says, get that member from here, and that member from here, and that member from here, and that member from here. So I'm doing four reads at the same time. And that's why this looks like that. I get four reads over, totally overlap. Now, banked memory is a nice trick. But didn't we have that with our register file? Don't you have that in the processor? You're allowed to do two reads at the same time. You got a block of 32 registers, and you say, give me any two, and bingo, out they pop. Any two can be accessed in parallel at the same time. If you wanted, you could have any four at the same time. Question? Does it cause uh, uh, increasing cost on space? Of course it costs increasing cost. Look at that. This is a much more com going to cost you some transistors. I'm going to have to have now uh, more control circuitry for the same amount of data. In other words, if I took that DRAM and divided it, its actual storage into these four banks, it doesn't cost me any more for storage because I have the same amount of storage. Can everybody see that? If I look at, at this one, that's the same amount of storage as these are total. But the difference is I've got now much more complicated control. Yeah, it costs more. Two ported register files are more expensive than one ported mem mem register files. Four bank memory is more expensive than one bank memory, of course. Now it's going to cost you in transistors. It's not free. But it has an enormous kazanch, which is what we're interested in. You know, we're, one more time, we're in the time-space trade-off. Are you willing to spend some transistors on the chip area in order to get better performance? If you say no, I'll be very surprised. Almost everybody these days says yes. We've got over a billion transistors. Let's spend some, Kardesh, to get a little bit better speed. And that's, that's been the story throughout this course. I don't know if you've noticed, but we're not saying, oh, man, it's really hard to do that in, in, in chip because we don't have any budget for it, and yeah, we just have to go slow. I've never said that. 
I've said the opposite a thousand times, which is when you need to go faster, find a way, spend some transistors and do it. Right? Remember the branch prediction circuitry? Remember all that forwarding business in the pipeline? We could always stall our pipe and just drink tea and wait till you know, the conflict is resolved naturally, but that costs time. Instead, we put in all kind of ajaib extra circuitry in order to not lose time. We don't like to drink tea. Well, we like to, but we don't have time to drink tea because there's pressure to perform. Tea drinking is when the job's over, not right in the middle of the work. Okay, more questions. Okan. Yeah, so that's a, that's a word, four bytes. So the grand total, I end up doing four words or 16 bytes in the 20 clock cycles, yeah. So bandwidth becomes 16 over 20. Yeah. Uh, why are the greens uh, hard to set up like that? Um, I don't understand. Because the uh, bus can carry only one? Yeah. Um, no, obviously the bus has to get a lot wider here. Look, what I'm doing is I'm transferring at the same time this and this and this and this. So obviously the bus got wider and is able to carry the data. The data is done in 15 cycles, as you can see. Four times the data in 15 cycles with full overlap. The only way to do that is a wider bus. No, there's, I'm, I got to confess to you, I don't actually know why the uh, uh, return the last data word is staggered like that. I don't, I don't know. Um, that could be. That could be. This is the last. Uh, it's, it's the byte that says, I'm finished with this write. And apparently, yeah, it can only do one write, not CPU, but cache architecture. We can only do one write at a time. And so sending four writes worth of data is possible because the bus says, sure, I've got that many lines. But over here, I, I can't write them all in at the same time. So maybe that's what's going on. You know, I, I can just guess. All right. Um, so there are some obvious differences, aren't there, in the system architecture here. So here's the summary about this section on DRAM. Um, it's important to match the cache's characteristics. Uh, caches access one block at a time, usually in multi-word blocks, with the DRAM characteristics. And the DRAMs, we need to have DRAMs that support, as it says here, fast, multiple word accesses, preferably ones that match the block size of the cache. If the DRAM access quantity matches the cache block quantity, that's the best. And the memory bus also has to allow this. As we just said, the last one depended on a wider memory bus. And so we have to make sure the memory bus can support the DRAM accesses that we're trying to do. And the goal is to increase the uh, bandwidth from memory bus to cache. All right, so there's some system architectural features here. You'll see these more on the homework. All right, now we come to my favorite part, which is performance. We're going to talk about how caches uh, help or hurt our performance. Now remember that our goal is to have uh, a pipeline with no stalls. And we've just realized that um, in order to do that, we have to have 100% cache hit. If we have a cache hit, it means when you try to fetch an instruction, it's there and you're good to go. When you try to access data memory, it's there and you're good to go. What if it's not? Oh, well then those misses are going to cause us to, in the processor, to have to stall the pipeline, drink tea until what you just saw happens and we bring it up. So we want to take into account that performance in our CPI. We'd like to have a way to uh, think about it. So I'm going to give you some little kind of modeling techniques here in the, in the first few slides, and then we're going to go into some numbers. Okay? All right, the components of CPU time are the program execution cycles, which includes the cache hit time. We've got to have a cache hit time for instruction cache and data hit that's less than a clock cycle. Remember how our pipeline works? Every stage has to fit in one clock cycle, so therefore the hit time has got to be less than a clock cycle. Or the other way around is the hit time will determine the clock cycle. If you've got a big slow hit time for a big slow cache, you're going to have a big slow clock cycle time and that'll affect all the stages in the pipeline. Remember, good pipeline design says every stage is about the same amount of delay. Well, clearly the delay of the instruction fetch stage and the delay of the data memory stage are totally related to cache hit time. Slow hit means slow clock cycle, slow pipeline. Fast hit means fast clock cycle, fast pipeline. Let's talk about hits. We haven't even touched misses yet. All right. Now, the next thing that's going to happen is if we miss and we have to stall because of memory, 
because of cache misses, then, notice it says mainly from cache misses, we could have a few other sources of slow memory problems as well. That's going to add to the program execution cycle. So this and this is going to be my CPI. Okay, we're going to make some simplifying assumptions that the memory stall cycles are something like this. Miss rate multiplied by miss penalty times how many times you access memory per program. Got it? So if I access memory 40% of the time and my miss rate is 10%, then 4% of the time I'm going to have to pay this miss penalty. Everybody see that? This is how often do I go to memory? I don't go to memory of every instruction. Well, actually I do for fetching and I go to it a second time for some data instructions. So it's how many instructions per program times how many misses per instruction times the miss penalty. Don't forget, you can miss on instruction fetch, you can miss on a data write or a data read, either one. So assuming that cache hit costs are included as part of the CPU cycle, in other words, the cache hit fits inside the clock cycle, then the CPU time is simply our famous equation here, instruction count times CPI times clock cycles, and we're going to expand CPI, including the memory stalls, to say it's the ideal CPI, whatever that is, maybe it's 1.0 for your pipeline or 0.5 for your pipeline or whatever, plus the memory stalls. This is the new factor. Our CPI was primarily until now just a processor CPI, but that was assuming we never had any problems getting things out of memory. But now we've got some memory problems because we realize fast memory and a hit, great, that's zero. But a miss and have to go to slow memory, that could be 50 to 100. Okay. All right, so memory stall cycles come from cache misses, which is the sum of read stalls and write stalls. We can miss in cache trying to read to it. We can read, read, read from it or write to it. Read stall cycles, how many reads per program times how many, what the miss rate is times the miss penalty. Write stall cycles is writes per program times the write miss rate times the write penalty plus the write buffer stalls. Yeah, don't forget, we've also got a thing called write buffer, and it causes the pipeline to stall under what condition? The write buffer can cause the pipeline to stall in addition to the cache can cause the pipeline to stall. Cache causes pipeline to stall when? It's a miss. Write buffer causes the pipeline to stall when? It's full. Exactly, it's full. You know, when it's not full, it says, great, I took it, I'll put it in later. But if it can't take it because it's full, then the write buffer says, sorry, pipeline, you can't give it to me uh, or we'll lose data. So I have to stall you. So we get both of those. Now for write through caches, we simplify this. Cause what do write through caches do? They write every time to uh, the lower one. So it's simply the accesses per program times the miss rate times the miss penalty. Okay? So, uh, it's, it's, but we don't want write through. We want write back primarily. That'll help us. So. What impact of cache performance do we have? Well, here's some, starting to get into some numbers. Let's, let's look through this and try to wrap our head around it. I'll be honest with you, uh, these kind of questions show up on homework number five. They'll show up on the final exam. So be, be thinking about this is important to get it and get it well. Back row, time to wake up. Tell your friend it'd be good to pay attention. Yeah, this is important. Right? If you want to get a good grade in the course or if you want to pass the course, then you need to focus here. Okay, <laughs> sorry to use that motivator, but I know, you know, late in the afternoon, back row, I used to, I used to be there. I was one of the back row sleepers. Yeah. Anyway, um, all right, the relative cash penalty increases as the processor speed gets faster. Listen to that. The relative cash penalty increases as the processor speeds up. It gets worse. It hurts worse if I have a faster processor. That's kind of weird, but... Let's see, I'm going to show an example here that shows it. Memory speed is unlikely to improve as fast as processor cycle time. Yes, processors are getting faster and faster, but memory is not keeping up. So when calculating the CPI of the stall, how many additional cycles do I have to put in because of a memory stall? And the cache miss penalty is measured not in nanoseconds, but in processor clock cycles. So let me just give you a quick example. Let's say that I have memory that can be accessed in... 60 nanoseconds, the, the slow stuff, main memory. And I miss in cache. If my processor cycle time is one nanosecond, then that means I have a penalty of 60 cycles. But let's say I've got a two gigahertz processor. So now my processor cycle time is a half a nanosecond. So now my miss penalty is not 60 clock cycles. No, no, no. It's 60 nanoseconds and every clock cycle is a half a nanosecond, so my penalty is 120 clock cycles. As processors get faster, 
the cycle penalty gets much, much worse. Okay, that's, what, that's the claim. Now we'll see an example. So the lower the ideal CPI, the more pronounced the effect of stalls. In other words, if my ideal CPI is 5 and I have a stall of 20, that's not hurting me nearly as bad as if my ideal CPI is 1 and I have a stall of 20. Ooh, ouch, ouch. One was factor of 4 drink tea, one was factor of 20 drink tea. Okay. All right, a processor with an ideal CPI, let's say, of 2, and a 100 cycle miss penalty, 36% load store instructions, 2% um, instruction cache, and 4% data cache miss rates. Do we understand all those numbers? That's the var of the problem. So if you can't go into the problem until you understand those numbers. Do we understand all those numbers? Okay, this says whatever the clock cycle time is, 100 of those is what happens if you miss in cache. Right? So you can make up numbers, but you know, 100 cycles, just like we just did some examples. It relates to the access time of main memory and the clock cycle time. But those don't matter. What matters is this, the ratio of the two. So 100 cycle miss penalty if you miss. That's for instruction cache. That's for data cache. It tells me that I go to memory 36% of the instructions. So what do I do on the other 64% of instructions? Don't go to memory. I don't touch memory. So therefore, I can't have a uh, data uh, miss on any of the other instructions. I could have an instruction fetch miss on every instruction. So you might say 136% of the instructions use cache. 100% uses instruction cache, 36% more use data cache because they're loads and stores. Do we understand that? Okay, that's what that says. This says 2% of the time when I go to instruction cache, I miss. This says 4% of the time when I go to data cache, I miss. Okay? Now the question is, how often do I go to instruction cache? Every instruction. How often do I go to data cache? 36% of the instructions. So therefore, 100% multiplied by this miss rate and 36% multiplied by this miss rate will tell me how often I miss in instruction cache and how, much I, how often I miss in data cache. Okay, so the number of memory stall cycles is 2% of 100 plus 4% of 36%. And whenever I miss, you can put that in parentheses, it's a 100 cycle penalty. So that adds up to, or multiplies out to, 3.44 memory cycle miss penalty per instruction. Are we OK? You understand that? You can multiply that number out and get 3.44. So now my CPI grand total is the lovely two CPI I had with no memory cycles lost to, no processor cycle, no clock cycles lost to memory stalls, and another 3.44. So I went from 2 to 5.44 when I put real memory on. And this is not too bad. That says 98% hit rate in the instruction cache, 96% hit rate in the data cache. That's not too shabby. That is not too shabby. Ouch, my lovely CPI went to pot. Just boom, exploded. I lost it. 5.44? Excuse me, that's almost three times as high as that. Ouch, I worked so hard to have a great processor, and now I gave it all away with cash misses. Ouch, 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 ouch. All right, now that's more than twice the CPI ideal. I called it closer to three times. Let's instead now work and speed up our processor, okay? We, we pipelined it better, or we double pipelined or something. So we got our, now our CPI ideal down to one, or maybe down to 0.5 or down to two point. What would this be? This would be four-way superscalar. This would be two-way superscalar pipelining, right? This is standard single pipeline. So one instruction per clock cycle finishes, two instructions per clock cycle finish, four instructions finish every clock cycle. Great, but this isn't changing, is it? Ouch! So you got this and then you add that on. Oh my goodness, it's something like, you know, 12 to 14 times larger than that. So for every instruction, you wait 14 more potential instruction times just on your stalls. Ouch! Do one, wait 14. Do one, wait 14. Right? Right now it's do one, wait about two more. Do one, wait about two more. But it, here it gets much worse. Much worse, much worse, much worse. Ouch. The cache miss penalty becomes unbearable as the processor gets faster and faster. And the reason is memory's not getting faster and faster at the same rate that was said earlier. Okay, now let's change something else. Let's say the data miss rate changes 
and it goes up by 1%. So instead of 4%, it goes to 5. What happens then? Multiply this out, it gets worse. What happens if the data miss rate goes up 2%? So instead of 4, it goes up to 6. Multiply that, this gets worse. Okay, what if the processor's clock rate is doubled? What happens if the plot processor's clock rate is doubled? Then this becomes a 200 cycle penalty, doesn't it? I speeded up the processor's clock rate, but when I miss in cache, I still have to spend the same amount of nanoseconds going to main memory and bringing it in, so it's twice as many cycles, isn't it? Ouch! So now I, I put 200 here, and that becomes 6.88. Try adding that to any of these numbers. 1 plus almost 7. 0.5 plus almost 7. 1 fourth plus almost 7. You know, you're, now you're dwarfing the processor's performance with this enormous memory penalty for missing. What's the solution, my friends? What's the solution? What's the solution? Make this small. How do we make that small? Make this small, or make this small, or make this, this small. That's the only thing we can do is hit rate or miss rates can be made small and miss penalty. Right? Hit rates higher, miss rates lower, and especially miss penalty small. Okay. Now, what do we say about multi-block cache words? They take a lot longer to bring in. The miss penalty gets bigger. Instead of one word, let's make it four. Instead of one word, let's make it 16. <laughs> That's going to get worse, isn't it? Okay, bad news, bad news, bad news. Actually, you know what? This lesson doesn't have too much good news. <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you. These are challenges for, for system designers. Big challenges. I, I told you already, hey, this is complicated. We're getting out into deep water. Now you see how deep it is. Okay. What do you think about somebody that, or a processor chip company that spends an enormous amount of effort making a high-speed processor, multi-pipeline, very high clock rate, um, and then doesn't spend the same amount of effort on their memory system design? What do you think about that? I'd say that's a pretty unsuccessful company, poorly managed, poor engineering approach, spend the resources. You see, you've got to consider the big picture. Making one thing go fast doesn't speed up the whole thing. In fact, the, the proverb, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, is extremely evident here, isn't it? A system is only as fast as its slowest component. A system is only as fast as its slowest component. It's also true that a system is only as reliable as its most unreliable component. There's that weakest link in lots of different analyses, and engineers need to be sure that we have a big picture and not a little picture so that we see the whole chain and all the links. All right, that's a good time for a break. I'm glad we did this. We'll come back to some more of this kind of performance stuff. Take 10 minutes. I'll see you soon.